Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to tackle a practice problem set for chapter three. If you've watched the lecture on chapter three, you've seen that there was a lot of integrated problems within the lecture. Today we're just going to do even more practice problems. So let's go ahead and get started and read this first problem. Problem one says, when aqueous solutions of ammonium phosphate and magnesium nitrate are mixed, they form solid magnesium phosphate and an aqueous solution of ammonium nitrate. Write the balanced chemical equation. Okay, before we even get started writing the balanced chemical equation, we have to write out this reaction. So the first two steps is determine what reaction is occurring, what are the reactants, what are the products and the physical states that are involved, and then go ahead and write the unbalanced equation that summarizes the reaction described in step one. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. It says ammonium phosphate and magnesium nitrate are mixed and then they form. Okay, so that first part, those are our reactants. We have ammonium phosphate. Let's go ahead and write those individual components. Ammonium is NH4 with a charge of plus one. Phosphate is PO4 with a charge of three minus. To go ahead and write ammonium phosphate, we're gonna exchange these charges and that tells us how many of these ions we have. And so for ammonium phosphate, we write NH4, in parentheses, there's three of these, PO4. There's only one phosphate. Okay, so that's ammonium phosphate. What about magnesium nitrate? Magnesium has a charge of two plus. Nitrate is NO3 minus. Now we can exchange these charges to determine how many of each ion we have. And for magnesium nitrate, it's Mg. And then we have NO3 in parentheses, we have two of these ions. Now these are aqueous solutions. It tells us in the problem. So we write AQ associated with both of these reactants because they are aqueous solutions. That's our reactants for this reaction. What about the product? What do they form when magnesium nitrate and ammonium phosphate combine? All right, it tells us that we get magnesium phosphate, all right, solid magnesium phosphate, and an aqueous solution of ammonium nitrate. Let's tackle those now. What does magnesium phosphate look like? Well, magnesium has a charge of two plus. Phosphate is PO4 with a charge of three minus. Now we're gonna exchange these charges to figure out how much of each ion we need. And for magnesium phosphate, this is gonna be Mg3, and then in parentheses we have PO4 with a two associated with that. We have three magnesiums, two phosphates. That is what solid magnesium phosphate is. And then again, we write a little S because this is solid magnesium phosphate. Wonderful, and then the second product we form is ammonium nitrate. Ammonium is NH4 with a charge of plus one. Nitrate is NO3 minus, and then we exchange these charges of plus one, minus one. Ammonium nitrate is just NH4, NO3. And this is an aqueous solution, so we write AQ. Beautiful, there we have it, this is the reaction that is happening, we were able to complete step one and step two. Now this is unbalanced and our main objective in this problem is to go ahead and balance this equation. Let's go ahead and touch up on our rules that we covered in lecture. After we've written the reaction in its unbalanced form, we have reactants on the left side, product on the right side, what do we do? Step three is balance one atom at a time, starting with the substance that has the most elements present. If necessary, you can use fractional coefficients to balance the simplest substance. Step four says small whole number coefficients. If there are any fractional coefficients, this is the time to remedy this by multiplying each coefficient by a factor that's gonna result in the smallest whole number coefficient. 
And then step five says, check each atom to ensure that the equation is balanced. Now, I really wanted to do this problem because there's a shortcut, right? When we generally begin balancing a chemical equation, we begin by balancing one atom at a time, starting with the substance that has the most elements present. But this particular problem, there's an easier way to approach. Just looking at the reactants and products, you see that what happened is that the ions were exchanged, but they weren't altered. And so on the reactant side, we have ammonium NH4, and this appears in the products as well. This NH4 ion wasn't separated into you know, different parts to form different products. No, that ammonium is transferred from reactants to products. It just has a different counter ion. All right. Same goes with phosphate, with magnesium, and with nitrate. Those ions are preserved in those forms. They just have different counter ions. And actually what you notice is that there was a double displacement here. All right. So this ammonium is now paired with nitrate. And this magnesium is now paired with phosphate. So these reactants exchanged ions, but they were reserved as they are. All right. They were not altered. Okay. So then in this case, what's going to be easier is to balance ions and not atoms. And so what we're going to do when we start balancing this reaction is we're going to start by balancing ammonium instead of just nitrogen or hydrogen or whatever, we're going to start by balancing ammonium. So what we're going to do is we're going to need a lot of space. So we're going to come down here where the reaction is rewritten. We're going to be begin with ammonium. Let's underline it in both the products and the reactants. And I'm going to create a divider between reactants and products. There are three ammoniums in the reactant side. All right. And there is only one in the product side. So what we're going to need to balance this is a coefficient of three right here so that now we have a total of three ammoniums on both reactant side and on the product side. OK. And again, remember, we're balancing ions in this case, not atoms. So we're going to continue with the next ion. What are we doing next? We're going to tackle phosphate on both the reactant and product side. Okay, what do we have here? We have one phosphate. All right, we have one phosphate on the reactant side, and we have two phosphates on the product side. Okay. What that means is if we're attempting to balance phosphate, we're going to need to have a coefficient of two right here. However, not right here. I'm so sorry. Right here. All right. That way we have two phosphates on both sides. But ammonium has already been balanced in the previous step. And if the coefficient of ammonium phosphate is changed, then ammonium will no longer be balanced. Okay. So this time we're going to go ahead and we're going to put that coefficient. And now we're going to have to go back and rebalance ammonium and that's okay. All right. It's good that we are paying attention where we're adding coefficients. So in order to balance phosphate, we had to put a coefficient of two right here, but that means that we now have six ammonium in the reactant side, not just three. And so we go back to where ammonium exists in the product side. We only have one. And in order to balance it with the reactant side, we're going to need a coefficient of six here so that we have six ammoniums in both the reactant and product side. And now you guessed it. Ammonium is balanced. Phosphate is balanced. Okay. That is great. Let's move on to our magnesium ion. All right. Here we have Mg. How many magnesiums do we have here? Just one. 
on the reactant side. Let's go ahead and look at the product side. On the product side, we have three magnesiums. So in order to balance magnesium on both the reactant and product side, here we have to add a coefficient of three. Beautiful. So we added a coefficient of three. Now we have three magnesiums on the reactant side and on the product side. We are left with our last ion, which is nitrate. So let's go ahead and look at nitrate on the reactant side and on the product side. So on the reactant side, on the reactant side, we have two nitrates, but remember we have a coefficient of three that we added here to balance magnesium. So what we actually have is three times two, which is equal to six. We have six nitrates on the reactant side. All right, perfect. How many do we have on the product side? Here we have NO3, there's a coefficient of six in front. We also have six nitrates on the product side. All right, and so we have six nitrates on the reactants and on the product side, that's perfect, it is balanced. Now, let's go ahead and write this out fully and properly with all our new coefficients. This is our reaction balanced. Two ammonium phosphates, all right, plus three magnesium nitrates, all right, this gives us one magnesium phosphate plus six ammonium, ammonium nitrates. All right, that is our balanced reaction. Notice there's not any fractional coefficients, so we don't have to remove them. And we can double check and notice that all the atoms are truly balanced. All right, and with that, We've completed this problem. Let's go ahead and move into our next problem. Problem two reads, write the balanced equation for the complete combustion of butanoic acid using the smallest whole number coefficients. And butanoic acid is given as C4H8O2. Now we know that this is a combustion reaction based off of the problem. Combustion, this is used to describe reactions where something burns in oxygen gas. And the product of a combustion reaction is gonna be carbon dioxide and water. So knowing this, we can go ahead and write the reaction. What is in the reactants? What is in the products? We can write it in the unbalanced form so that we can begin to work through balancing that chemical reaction. So what we have is butanoic acid, C4H8O2, and oxygen gas, and that gives us carbon dioxide gas and water. So this is our reaction. This is unbalanced, so now we can begin to look at the atoms that appear in both the reactants and product side and begin to balance it. Now, one thing that we need to know looking at this is that oxygen appears by itself in the form of oxygen gas. Anytime an element occurs all by itself in a chemical equation, like oxygen gas here, you should save it for last. It's gonna make it a lot easier to balance oxygen if we leave it as the last element to balance. So let's go ahead and balance first and foremost carbon. Carbon appears here in the reactant side and here on the product side. We have on the reactant side four carbons. On the product side, we only have one carbon. In order to balance the carbons, we're going to add a coefficient of four here in front of carbon dioxide to give us a total of four carbons on the product side, which matches with the four carbons on the reactant side. Okay, next, we're going to balance hydrogen. Here's where we have hydrogen in the reactant side, and here's where we have hydrogen in the product side. In the reactant side, we have a total of eight hydrogens. On the 
product side, we have a total of just two hydrogens. In order to balance the hydrogens on the product side, we're going to add a coefficient of four in front of water. And that gives us a total of eight hydrogens on the product side, which matches with the eight hydrogens on the reactant side. Now we can finally balance oxygen. On the reactant side, we have oxygen from butanoic acid, and we also have oxygen gas. And then on the product side, we have oxygen that appears in carbon dioxide, and we also have oxygen that appears in water. So, how many total oxygens do we have on the reactant side? We have two from butanoic acid, two from oxygen gas, which gives us a total of four oxygens on the reactant side. How many on the product side? Well, we have eight from carbon dioxide and four from water. So this gives us a total of 12. This gives us a total of 12 oxygens on the product side. Okay, and we have four total oxygens on the reactant side. Now let's go ahead and pretend that we're not going to touch butanoic acid, all right? Because if we touch butanoic acid, if we add coefficients here, we're gonna have to correct the way that we balanced both carbon and hydrogen. So we're gonna ignore the oxygen that appears in butanoic acid, and we're only gonna manipulate the oxygen that appears in oxygen gas. So this two, these two oxygens that come from butanoic acid are not going to be manipulated. They're going to stay as two. We're going to add some sort of coefficient to oxygen gas so that when we add the total oxygens from oxygen gas plus the two from butanoic acid, they add up to a total of 12. How can we do this? Well, if we subtract two from the total of 12 from the product, saying that we don't touch the, the two oxygens from butanoic acid, we get a total of 10 oxygens that we need to compensate for on the reactant side to make sure that everything is balanced. Sorry, I dropped my mic. I will try to edit that out. But regardless, what coefficient can we add in front of O2 to get us 10 oxygens? That's gonna be just a coefficient of five. And if we do that, now we have 10 plus two for a total of 12 oxygens on the reactant side that matches appropriately with the 12 oxygens on the product side. All right. And with that, we've balanced both sides. Notice we didn't use any fractional coefficients that we have to correct for. But what we can do is go ahead and rewrite our newly balanced equation, and double check that everything is indeed balanced. We have C4H8O2 plus 5O2 gives us 4CO2 plus 4H2O. We have four carbons on the reactant side, four carbons on the product side, great. We have eight hydrogens on the reactant side, eight hydrogens on the product side, Fantastic. Then we have 2 plus 10 for a total of 12 oxygens on the reactant side and 8 plus 4 for a total of 12 oxygens on the product side. All of the atoms are balanced, so the equation is correct. And we have completed problem 2. Let's go ahead and move into problem 3. Problem three reads, consider the following balanced equation. What mass of oxygen gas is required to completely react with 25 grams of iron? Our goal is to figure out grams of oxygen gas. What we're given to start is 25 grams of iron. So let's say that that is our mass of X, 25 grams of iron. And our goal is to figure out grams of oxygen 
gas. Let's say that that is Y. All right. So giving that assignment, let's follow this guide that we discussed in the lecture to go from one conversion or one unit into another from 25 grams of iron to grams of oxygen gas. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take our mass of X, AKA our mass of iron, and we're going to convert it to moles of iron. How are we going to do that? We're going to use molar mass. Now that we have moles of iron, the next conversion is to get moles of Y, aka oxygen gas. How are we going to do this? We're going to use a mole to mole ratio of oxygen to iron. And then last, now that we have moles of oxygen, we can convert it to mass of oxygen using molar mass of oxygen. So now we have kind of a outline of the steps that we need to do. Let's go ahead and attempt to do them. So we're starting off with 25 grams of iron. First thing we wanna do is convert to moles of iron using molar mass. The molar mass of iron is 55.85 grams of iron for one mole of iron. Now that we have moles of iron, and you notice that grams of iron cancel out, we're going to use a mole to mole ratio to go from moles of iron to moles of oxygen. How are we going to do this? We're going to use the coefficients that are associated with both oxygen and iron. For three moles of iron, we have two moles of oxygen. So that is our mole to mole ratio. For three moles of iron, we have two moles of oxygen gas. And notice, moles of iron cancels out. And now for our last and final step, we're going to use the molar mass of oxygen gas to move from moles to grams and get our final answer. So the molar mass of oxygen is 32 grams of oxygen for one mole of oxygen gas. Moles cancel out. We're left with our desired unit of grams of oxygen gas. If we plug this into a calculator, we're going to get 9.55 grams of oxygen gas. And there you have it. We answered this problem. The mass of oxygen gas that is required to completely react with 25 grams of iron is 9.55 grams of oxygen gas. Now we can move on to our last and final problem. Problem four reads, hydrogen chloride gas is made commercially by reacting sodium chloride with concentrated sulfuric acid, and we're given the reaction here. If the percent yield for this process is known to be 80.7%, how many kilograms of sodium chloride should be treated with excess sulfuric acid in order to obtain 75 kilograms of hydrochloric acid? The first thing that's important to realize in this problem is that 75 kilograms of hydrochloric acid represents the actual yield. If you have difficulty determining whether a given value in a stated problem represents the actual yield, there's a simple rule of thumb. Here's the rule. Insert the term actually into the sentence. If it makes sense, then the value is the actual yield. So let's try inserting actually into this problem. All right, if we do, the sentence now reads, if the percent yield for this process is known to be 80.7%, how many kilograms of sodium chloride should be treated with excess sulfuric acid in order to actually obtain 75 kilograms of hydrochloric acid? And so we know, here that inserting the word actually makes sense, it clarifies the question, and it emphasizes that 75 kilograms of hydrochloric acid is the actual yield. Now, you might be tempted then to take 75 kilograms of hydrochloric acid and use that to start a stoichiometry calculation where you convert sulfuric acid grams or kilograms of sulfuric acid all the way to kilograms of sodium chloride using molar mass and mole-to-mole -mole ratios like we've talked about before. But that would be incorrect. 
This value is our actual yield. If we go ahead and we mix sodium chloride and sulfuric acid in lab in their optimal quantities, considering human error and instrument error, what we actually get in lab is 75 kilograms of sulfuric acid. All right. What we actually want as a starting place for our um, stoichiometry calculation is the theoretical yield of hydrochloric acid. Because then moving from our theoretical yield and doing our stoichiometry calculation to get kilogram of sodium chloride, that is what we would actually want to mix with excess sulfuric acid in the hopes that even with human error and instrument error, that we get a practical actual yield of 75 kilograms of sulfuric acid. So actually, our first step here is to figure out the theoretical yield of hydrochloric acid. And what we're going to take advantage of is this equation right here. Percent yield equals actual yield over theoretical yield minus 100%. We are given the percent yield and the actual yield in the problem, so we can rearrange this equation to actually just solve for the theoretical yield. So let's write that down. I'm going to write theoretical yield as TY to shorten it. Theoretical yield is going to equal actual yield over percent yield multiplied by 100%. We have all of these values so we can just plug in. Our actual yield is 75 kilograms of hydrochloric acid. Our percent yield is 80.7%, all multiplied by 100%. This gives us a theoretical yield of 92.9 .9 kilograms of hydrochloric acid. Now we can take this and use it as our starting place for our stoichiometry calculation to figure out kilograms of sodium chloride. What we're going to do is we're, we're going to start with our kilograms of hydrochloric acid. All right, kilograms of hydrochloric acid. We're going to want to convert this to grams of hydrochloric acid so that we can use molar mass to get moles of hydrochloric acid. And then when we have moles of hydrochloric acid, we're going to use mole to mole ratio of hydrochloric acid to sodium chloride to get moles of sodium chloride. And then finally, use molar mass of sodium chloride to get grams of sodium chloride. And then, of course, we can go ahead and convert grams of sodium chloride to kilograms of sodium chloride because that is the form that this problem asks for. It asks, how many kilograms of sodium chloride do we need? Now, before we start this process, the first thing that you should always do is, of course, check if your reaction is balanced so that you know you can use the appropriate mole-to-mole -mole ratios when you're doing this calculation. Go ahead and double check if this reaction is balanced. I'll give you a second to pause and do that on your own. And now I'm going to tell you that this reaction is indeed balanced. So we're just going to go ahead and begin our stoichiometry calculation. We have 92.9 .9 kilograms of hydrochloric acid. We're going to go ahead and convert that to grams of hydrochloric acid. This is very easy. 92.9 .9 times 10 to the 3 grams of hydrochloric acid equal 92.9 .9 kilograms of hydrochloric acid. So we're going to start here. Then we're going to do molar mass conversion to get moles of hydrochloric acid. 36.46 grams of hydrochloric acid equal one mole of hydrochloric acid. Then we're going to do a mole to mole conversion. One mole of HCl to one mole of sodium chloride based off of just our problem. There's a one to one mole to mole ratio here. Then we're going to do a molar mass conversion. One mole of sodium chloride is equal to 58.44 grams of sodium chloride. And you notice grams of hydrochloric acid cancel out, moles of hydrochloric, uh, hydrochloric acid cancel out, and moles of sodium chloride cancel out. And the units that we're going to be left with is grams of sodium chloride. 
if we plug this into the calculator, what we're going to get is 1.49 times 10 to the 5 grams of sodium chloride. If we convert this to kilograms, it's just going to be 149 kilograms of sodium chloride. And there you have it. We have solved this problem. And so we need 149 kilograms of sodium chloride to be treated with excess sulfuric acid in order to obtain hopefully at least 75 kilograms of sulfuric acid. I hope that this problem set was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day.